stand up. Come on, Toby, we need you for this one. Okay, because the response uh, after each line in this call to worship is shake us up. And so, you know, that, that requires a little bit of, of movement, you know, maybe a big jump or a shake or a wiggle. Asking God to wake us up this morning and prepare us to worship. So, are you ready for that? We need, you need to stand up, Toby, or it won't work. <laughs> okay. Alpha and Omega God, when our worship becomes stale, shake us up. When our lives become complacent, shake us up. When we take people for granted, shake us up. When our prayers are half-hearted, shake us up. When our days are predictable, shake us up. When we say we can't, shake us up. <laughs> in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's worship God in song.
going to pray together now. I asked in the Facebook feed this morning, what are you thankful for? Maybe you've written some more comments that I haven't been able to see yet. But first and foremost, people seem to be thankful to be able to gather to worship in this way. It's good to come before God to be reminded of who it is that we live our lives for and with. So let's pray and let's give thanks to God. Lord, we are so grateful for the chance to come before you this morning to lift our voices in song, our hearts in praise. Lord, you are a good, good God. You're the rock on which our lives stand. Everything comes from you and everything goes to you. You are the reason that we live. And so this morning, as we lift our voices to you, as we turn our attention to you, we pray that you will help us to give you our full attention that we would engage with scripture this morning, that we would learn something new about you and that we would be open to the movement of your Holy Spirit in our hearts today, that we would not just meet with you, but that we would be changed by you and grow ever more into the likeness of Jesus, our saviour whom we serve. And Lord, as we stop and as we pause, and as we turn our minds before you and your throne of grace, we're aware of our own shortcomings, the times when we've failed you, we've let you down, the times when we have been unkind to others, the times when we've put to one side and just out of sight the needs of our world and the suffering of others. Lord, help us to recognise the wrong in our lives. Help us to be aware of our sin so that we confess it, can confess it, but not only that, so that we can change and become more like you. So we ask that you would take our wrongs now as we leave them at the foot of the cross. Pour your forgiveness into our hearts that we could be made new. Gladly and gratefully we receive that forgiveness now. Lord, we don't want to remain the same. Lead us on with you, we pray, in the precious name of Jesus. You taught us when we pray together to say, Our Father, 
who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, and thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Oh, Amen. Oh, well, it's, it's time now for our sign of the week. And we're going to cross to Alice, but we're going to do things just a little bit differently this morning. Good morning, Alice. Hopefully you're going to... Yes, it's well. Alice, if Good you... Good morning. Ah, there you are. Brilliant. Good morning, Alice. It's such a relief when it works. Um, now, Alice, lots of people have um, been giving us feedback about your signs. Such positive feedback. People are really enjoying um, our signs of the week. Um, and this, uh, this it's kind of additional dimension that you're bringing to our worship. And we're so grateful for you. But people have been asking, well, why, why is Alice doing this? Uh, what's her story? And what exactly is this type? Oh, what exactly is this type of signing? that Alice does. You're having a few problems with your iPad there, Alice. <laughs> yeah, I've got another device set up, so it's, it might be better to see me on the other one if possible so that I don't, yeah, I, you don't lose me on my iPad. You're coming through fine on this one at the moment. All right, okay, we'll, we'll, cool. we'll, we'll press on. So Alice, just tell us a little bit about how it is that you got into signing in the first place and what exactly this type of signing is that we're doing. Okay, so um, I've been working at a school for uh, children with speech and language needs uh, since last September and um, we use this type of signing every single day all day all the time we're talking to the children we're signing along um, this signing is called Makaton it was created um, in the 70s specifically for children and adults with um, special needs um, those who um, struggle to use words to communicate, but also those who struggle to understand um, spoken communication. So it's not um, it's not a sign language in the sense that it replaces language like you have with uh, British Sign Language, where it's a whole language in its own right. It's just what's called um, a signing system, so it supports the language. Um, what it does is it gives like a visual um, of words so that people can um, understand it better because they're not only using you know their, their ears to understand to process it they're using their eyes to visually see it as well. That's absolutely fascinating and tell us about the faith signs as well. So um, about when was it? Um, it was right before lockdown um, me and a few others from the URC, um, including Phil Ray, um, went on a Christian Faith Signs um, course led by a lady called Becky George, um, who is a Makaton tutor. And she ran a course basically just teaching people how to use Makaton in a church setting. Um, and it was really fab and it got me really, really inspired to um, take something that I do in my, in my job and make it, you know, um, a part of kind of like the faith side of my life as well. Yeah, well, we're absolutely thrilled that you have because you're enhancing our worship, you're enabling us as a church family to be uh, to be more inclusive. Um, and I know that everybody who's um, sharing in these services is joining along and appreciating being able to learn. Um, so, Alice, we're, we're going to go for it this morning, aren't we, in a big way? And we're going to we're going to yes. not just do a sign of the week. We're going to do um, a whole song this week and it's a song that we're going to use later in the service after our sermon so children young people this is just a little word for you now um after the puppets get going on your sermon challenge because you need to come back straight after the sermon um for the song because that's when we're going to sign this song that we're going to learn it now but sing it and sign it later okay alice so go for it so um the song we're doing is faithful god so um, I'm just going to move my chair away so that you can see my body a bit better because some of the signs need more of your body involved. So um, we start off with faithful. Uh, we've, I'm pretty sure we've done this one before, but we may not have done. So you start with a, a thumbs up hand position, but you 
touch your temple with your thumb and then you flatten out your hand a bit like a sort of karate chop and you chop your um, other flat hand faithful so it's faithful and then God we've done lots of times pointing up and looking up God so we do that twice all sufficient one will use the sign for everything we've done this one once before but it is um, a bit of a tricky one so we start at the bottom with our hands together um like we're cupping something we bring them around to make sort of like a bowl shape and then when you get to the top of the bowl your hands change to you pointing up to the sky then once you've got your hands pointing up to the sky with your index fingers you bring your fists in front of you with the back of your hand facing away from you and you tap them in the middle. So as you can see, my little fingers are touching each other and my thumbs are tucked away. So that's what we're doing for all sufficient one. I worship you. Worship's a nice one. We touch our forehead with the tips of our fingers and then we just bring our hands down in front of us. So they're sort of horizontal. They stay flat the whole time. I worship you. And you can sort of look up to God. That's a nice little touch because you're talking to him. I worship you. Shalom, my peace. We've done the sign for peace before. It's thumb and finger pinched in the middle and you just draw them out. Shalom, my peace. My strong deliverer is wrists together as if you're handcuffed. I, we have done this one once before. And then you release them and you release your hands and put your arms by, by your sides. Um, and then I think it's I worship you again. And then faithful God. It's, it's, it's I lift you up. Oh, sorry, yeah. you're right. <laughs> I lift you up. I lift you up. Faithful God. Faithful God. Brilliant. Alice, thank you. I think we'll um, we'll run through the whole thing maybe just in one continuous swoop now. And then yeah. when we come to do this song later in the service, we're going to have Alice back on the screen because we, we weren't brave enough. <laughs> um, we might get it wrong. And, and so we really wanted to have the expert up on the screen. So the words um, for this hymn, when we use it later on in the service, are pinned to the top of the Facebook feed. They're also on the order of service sheets, which are on the website. So you'll be able to get the words from there. OK, let's go for it. So faithful... Faithful God, faithful God, all sufficient one, I worship you, shalom my peace, my strong deliverer, I lift you up. Faithful God. Brilliant. I know that everybody is going to have remembered that later on in the service, but it's a good <laughs> thing that you're going to be back to remind us. Alice, thank you so much, and we will see you later. Yes, see you later. Bye. Right, it's time now for our puppets. We're moving on to the next chapter of Acts. So, guys, do you want to go and get ready? You go and get ready. Okay. And we will head through to see what's happening in our story this week. That is an advance. Okay. Are they ready? Well, they're just about ready. <laughs> getting ready. there. They're getting ready. Soon be ready. Okay, hold on. It's probably not coming through on the camera's microphone, but it's really noisy behind me. <laughs> There's a lot of, no, no, you move out the way, no! <laughs> okay, Justin's going to go and get in position as well. We've reached Acts chapter 16. We are racing through Acts. So welcome back to the Acts of the Apocalypse, the story of how after Jesus returned to heaven, he continued to act through his followers on earth as they told the story of his life, his death and his resurrection. So let's meet our storyteller, Luke. Good morning, Luke. Uh, Luke, you, you're still writing the story down, aren't you? Yes. 
the story of how the first Christians set the world on fire with the love of Jesus. Is it is it an exciting story today, Luke? Of course it is. It always is. So let's meet Paul again. Now, in these last few weeks of our puppet series, our attention will be on the amazing adventures that Paul had with his travelling companions as they travel far and wide, spreading the news of Jesus. In today's story, his travelling companion is Silas. Hello, Silas. Good morning. Today, we're also going to meet Lydia. Hello, Lydia, with her lovely purple cloak. Yes. Lydia's a businesswoman. And there's also other characters to look out for as well, especially this little chap. Where is he, Toby? Oh, hello. Uh, I'm not quite sure exactly what you are, but you're very bright and cheerful. So whenever you see this chap, you can wave cheer right on the Facebook feed. You might even want to tell us what you think he is. OK, thank you. What is it, darling? It's an alien. Oh, it's an alien. Toby thinks it's an alien. OK. It is an alien. Well, let's start off with Paul and Silas. Paul had set off with Silas on a major journey to Greece and they had arrived at Philippi. Philippi was a busy city where the Romans have a large garrison and business people from all over the world come and go. There was no synagogue where the Jewish people met in Philippi, but some people met for prayer down by the river on the Sabbath. And it was there that Paul and Silas met Lydia. Lydia was a successful businesswoman who sold purple cloth, which was very valuable. <coughs> she loved God. And when Paul and Silas told her about Jesus, she immediately opened her heart to the Lord and was baptised with her whole family. Well, Paul and Silas stayed with Lydia's family after that and continued to tell people about Jesus. But as they travelled, they started to be followed around by a young slave girl who was possessed by a spirit. This young slave girl could tell the future and so her masters made lots of money out of her. But when Paul and Silas appeared, the spirit within her cried out, These men are servants of God. They're declaring to you the way of salvation. Well, this following around of Paul and Silas by the girl continued day after day until one day Paul turned round and he spoke directly to the spirit in her and said, I command you in the name of Jesus, come out of her. And immediately the demon left her. But the men who kept the slave girl were angry because they wouldn't be able to make money out of her anymore. And so they had Paul and Silas thrown into jail. Hang on. Into jail. A jailer was sent to arrest them, put them in chains and then went back to his own house. Well, even though they were in prison, Paul and Silas still sang songs of praise to God. And at about midnight, where, while they were doing that, singing their praises to God most high, there was a sound outside. And they realised it was the beginnings of a great earthquake which shook the prison. The chains fell off Paul and Silas. And the prison door swung open. Well, when the jailer realised what had happened, he rushed over to the prison. He was terrified because he thought all the prisoners would have escaped. In fact, he knew he'd be in such trouble that he hadn't kept them locked up that he got ready to kill himself. But then he heard Paul cry out, Don't do that. We're still here. He was amazed and said to Paul and Silas, Gentlemen, what must I do to get out of this mess? Paul and Silas gave him the answer. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you and your household will be saved. Well, the jailer became a Christian there and then. And he decided to take them home to wash their wounds and to give them a meal. Well, the next day, the magistrate came to release Paul and Silas. He said, where's the magistrate? Hang on, he's come. Oh, there he is. Hello, magistrate. <laughs> the magistrate came to release Paul and Silas. He said, right, no more trouble and you can go on your way. But Paul and Silas refused to move. You've beaten us without a trial. 
You've thrown us into prison and now want to release us secretly. What you don't know is that we are Roman citizens. You aren't allowed to treat us this way. You are in big trouble. This made the magistrate very nervous. Being a Roman citizen was a big deal back then. So he apologised to Paul and Silas. I'm terribly sorry, I didn't know. Please, please go on your way and don't get us into trouble. So Paul and Silas did go on their way, but not before visiting Lydia and her family one more time and saying goodbye. So it had been quite an adventure in the city of Philippi. People from all kinds of backgrounds had come to believe in Jesus in all kinds of ways. But there was even more excitement still to come, wasn't there? So join us next time for our next instalment of the Acts of the A Puppets. Thank you, everybody. Goodbye. <laughs> well done. The prison gate just about stayed open, didn't it? Yeah, there we go. We're going to go through and sing a song about being bold and strong in Jesus, just as Paul and Silas were. Let's go through. Be bold, be strong, for the Lord your God is with you. Is it all going to be fine? Yeah. Okay. You're going to do actions for this one, aren't you? Okay. Do you remember this is the one where we have to shout back at everybody? Okay, here we go. Be bold. read our bible reading so we're not going to read all of acts chapter 16 we have told all of the story um, in the puppets but we're going to begin at verse 16 so from verse 16 one day as we were going to the place of prayer we met a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners a great deal of money by fortune telling while she followed Paul and us, she would cry out, These men are slaves of the Most High God who proclaim to you a way of salvation. She kept doing this for many days. But Paul, very much annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I order you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. But when her owners saw that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the authorities. When they had brought them before the magistrates, they said, These men are disturbing our city. 
They're Jews and are advocating customs that are not lawful for us Romans to adopt or observe. The crowd joined in attacking them, and the magistrates had them stripped of their clothing and ordered them to be beaten with rods. After they'd given them a severe flogging, they threw them into prison and ordered the jailer to keep them securely. Following these instructions, he put them in the innermost cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was an earthquake, so violent that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were unfastened. When the jailer woke up and saw the prison doors wide open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself since he supposed that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted in a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for we're all here. The jailer called for lights and rushing in, he fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them outside and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They answered, Believe on the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. They spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. At the same hour of the night he took them and washed their wounds. Then he and his entire family were baptised without delay. He brought them up into the house and set food before them, and he and his entire household rejoiced that he had become a believer in God. When morning came, the magistrate sent the police, saying, Let these men go. And the jailer reported the message to Paul, saying, the magistrate sent word to let you go, therefore come out now and go in peace. But Paul replied, They have beaten us in public, uncondemned, men who are Roman citizens, and have thrown us into prison. And now are they going to discharge us in secret? Certainly not. Let them come and take us out themselves. The police reported these words to the magistrates, and they were afraid when they heard that they were Roman citizens. So they came and apologised to them, and they took them out and asked them to leave the city. After leaving the prison, they went to Lydia's home, and when they had seen and encouraged the brothers and sisters, there they departed. In this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So let us pray. Loving God, may the words of my mouth and the thoughts and meditations of each of our hearts this day be acceptable in your sight. You are God, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. So today's story from the book of Acts is all about freedom. It's also involved a jail scene, as lots of stories in Acts seem to. I don't know if you've heard the story about the bungling convicts who, convicts who were trying to escape from their prison. They'd hatched an elaborate escape plot involving digging a long tunnel to the outside perimeter of the prison compound where they hoped to get out and find their freedom. Unfortunately, they miscalculated the direction that they were digging in. And after months and months of hard work digging and digging, they finally tunneled back up to the surface, only to find that they would tunneled their way into the local police station. Can you believe it? Everyone needs to find freedom, don't they? Whatever class or background people are from, everyone needs freedom. Many people think they are free, but they aren't really. Many people are bound by things that aren't visible, but keep them in chains. So today, we firstly heard the story of Lydia, who became a convert to Christianity. As a seller of purple cloth, we know therefore that she would have been a wealthy woman from the higher class in the town of Philippi. And in this story, we also see Paul interacting with two more people who would be set free by the power of God. But these two converts represent different tiers of society. There is the lowest in the form of this deeply troubled slave girl being used and abused by her owners to make money. And then there's the middle class jailer and his family. Both the slave girl and the jailer experience a release to freedom in the story. When Paul casts the demon out of the girl, she's freed from these powers which are possessing her and the powers of her owners who are keeping her enslaved. But they turn on Paul and Silas because they've taken away their earnings, the owners of the slave girl. 
They've had their earnings taken away and they turn on Paul and Silas because of that. And this is such a reminder that God is against the enslavement of people for any reason whatsoever, that God desires freedom for all. Apart from the slave girl then, the other person to find freedom is the jailer. The jailer is bound by the fear of his employers, the Romans, who have the power to put him to death if prisoners escape, so much so that he was willing to take his own life first. And that, of course, is something that he will be free from by the end of the story. But he's also about to experience spiritual freedom. By the end of the passage, we read how he and his whole family were filled with joy because they now believed in God. So this story of the three converts in Philippi, Lydia, the slave girl and the jailer, is a brilliant way of showing how the gospel is for everyone, indiscriminate. From the high class to the middle class to the seemingly insignificant in society. We are all equally in need of Jesus and we are all equal at the foot of the cross, all made in the perfect image of God. Maybe there's someone you know who you think, well, Christianity's not for them. They don't need this. Well, today's story in the city of Philippi shows us that that is actually not true. Don't prejudge who may or may not be called. Everybody needs Jesus. It's not just the people who realise it at the moment. It's the people who don't realise it yet as well. Until Paul and Silas turn up, Lydia, the slave girl, and the jailer are all just getting on with their lives. And then they all receive freedom in different ways. Lydia is like an open door to the message. She immediately knows that Jesus is the one that she's been waiting for. The slave girl is set free in a dramatic moment by the same Jesus. And the jailer faces a crisis and finds that Jesus is the one waiting for him in the mess and confusion of his life. So all three of them receive freedom. So don't assume that the people you know are free. Everybody is bound by things, often without realising it. And everybody needs the freedom that we find in Christ. But here's the twist in today's story. The only person who experiences freedom from start to finish is the one who's in prison. Paul, and indeed his companion Silas, have the ability to remain free even when they are in chains. They experience true freedom throughout, no matter what the circumstances are that they're experiencing. True freedom is when you can sing and pray through the night, having just been unjustly beaten and imprisoned. True freedom comes when nothing that the world throws at you can take away your joy. Experiencing true freedom is one of the aspects of Christian life that is fundamental to experiencing the fullness of Christ within us. And it doesn't necessarily have a lot to do with the circumstances of our lives or what's going on around us. It's this freedom that's experienced internally. It can't be taken away because it comes from a source that cannot be shaken. Many of you will be familiar with the story of Eric Liddell, you may have seen the film or the stage show Chariots of Fire of his Olympic sporting success, even though he refused to run his best race, the 100 metres, on a Sunday. What many people don't know is the story of Liddell after the Olympics were over. Liddell was a devout Christian and his faith took him back to the place where he was born, China, where he lived as a missionary. But when part of China fell to the Japanese during World War II, he was captured and he was held in miserable conditions in an internment camp. But in that prison, Liddell was a ray of light and hope to the other inmates. And one article puts it this way. Let me read it to you. Though his situation was certainly dire, his spirit didn't wane. And while some people in the camp selfishly hoarded their supplies, Liddell spent his time teaching children and sharing what he had. When a few rich businessmen managed to convince the guards to smuggle them in extra rations, Liddell's natural charisma was such that he was able to convince them to share the food with everyone, and he was the first port of call when any dispute in the camp needed to be settled. He even reportedly finally took part in a sporting event on a Sunday, 
a fight broke out in the game, and to stop it, Liddell, who was well respected by all in the camp, stepped in, and then after things settled down, volunteered to referee the rest of the match. Given that this wasn't about his own glory, but about keeping the peace, it presumably didn't conflict with his ideology. So if you're not yet impressed with Liddell's integrity, here's the part that shows you really what kind of man he was. While in the camp, Liddell was ravaged by malnourishment and ill health. It was found later that he had a brain tumour, but he obviously didn't know about that at the time. Despite this, when Winston Churchill managed to secure Liddell's release in a prisoner exchange, he declined and instead offered his place to a pregnant woman who was also in the camp. Saving, of course, not only her life, but the life of her unborn child. Besides his declining health, this must have been a particularly difficult decision, given that he had a wife and three daughters that he hadn't seen in well over a year. One of them, Maureen, he never got a chance to actually know. Much like most of his life's work, he didn't do this for any sense of fame or recognition. In fact, he didn't even mention this fact to his family in subsequent letters. In his last letter to his wife, as his health deteriorated, he simply mentioned that he thought he was perhaps overworked. And on the 20th, sorry, the 21st of February 1945, a few months before the camp was liberated, Liddell died. Like Poole and Silas, Eric Liddell was free, even though he was in prison. When we get annoyed or pulled down or overwhelmed by the things that life throw at us, it's worth looking at the example of Paul and Silas and people like Eric Liddell. Even in great suffering, they were able to live and move in the grace of Christ. What a challenge for us. This is the miraculous kind of peace and joy and freedom that truly loving Christ can bring. It's the kind of freedom that allows you to sing at the top of your lungs, even when the circumstances around you say that you shouldn't be. It comes through knowing Christ. It comes through being so in love with him that you're able to say, like Paul, that we count it a privilege to be joined with Christ in his suffering. Paul was used to be treated badly for his, for his faith, but here's how he describes it in his letter to the Romans. These are familiar words, but think about them in the context of what Paul has just been through in our story today. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for his sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels nor demons, nor the present nor the future, nor powers nor height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is ours in Christ Jesus our Lord. Those are the words of somebody who has found what true freedom is and we can find it too. It's available for us to experience today. God wants us to turn to him, to trust him, to experience it. Like the song we love to sing, what a friend we have in Jesus. Oh, what needless pain we suffer. Oh, what endless grief we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. We don't turn to him and we don't receive that freedom that is ours for the taking. In the story from Acts, when the earthquake comes, Paul could have had his chance for physical freedom. He could have walked out of the jail there and then. But instead, they choose to use their freedom to save the jailer and his family. Firstly, his decision to stay put despite the, uh, the chance of escape means that the jailer's life is saved from the wrath of the Roman employers. But secondly, he's able to minister to the jailer and lead him and his whole family to Christ. In Galatians 5 verse 1, we read these words. It was for freedom that Christ has set us free. We have been set free so that we can be freedom bringers. When Christ sets us free from sin and fear or anything else which binds us, then we are set free in order to bring freedom to others. I have been blessed in order to be a blessing to others. You have been blessed in order to be a blessing to others. Our freedom is not just for us. 
The Book of Acts is all about how these first followers turned the world upside down through the love of Jesus. They acted in ways that went against all the norms. They loved people from different backgrounds. They displayed courage in the face of adversity. In the face of beatings and imprisonment, they experienced true freedom. And it spread like wildfire because other people want to be free as well. And they saw in these followers something that they had within them that made them truly free, whatever their circumstances were. And that something, of course, was the life of Jesus in them. You and I can have that life of Jesus in us every day when we invite him in through the power of the Holy Spirit. Our faithful God breaks the chains that bind us. And so this morning, my prayer is this, that you, through the power of the Holy Spirit moving in you as you listen and worship this morning, would think about what it is that binds you, what it is that keeps you captive. Perhaps it's a situation, perhaps it's something going on internally for you, perhaps it's deep anxiety or pain or fear or trauma, worry, whatever it might be. Can you bring it to the foot of the cross this morning? And can you claim that freedom in Christ, that deep peace and joy that can live within your hearts even when the storms are raging all around you or within you? Can you know that deep peace of Christ which he died to bring you this morning? We're going to sing of our faithful God. We're going to grab the children back. You might want to grab your children back as well because this is the one where Alice is going to help us to sing this song, not just with our voices, but with our bodies as well. Faithful God, I'm going to call the children. We're ready for the song now. doing my 20 piece puzzle. I'll show the pieces. I'll show the pieces that I'm going to sing about. Do I remember the assigned to mm -hmm. this? Yes. Do the pieces need an outside?
Loving God, we thank you that you are the faithful God who breaks the chains, the things which bind us. And we pray for each person sharing in this act of worship this morning that you would move in each person's heart to break the chains in Jesus' name. Amen. And now we're going to cross to Vivian, who's going to lead us in our time of prayer for others. Thank you very much, Vivian. Almighty God, our loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for the freedom that we have to come before you and pray for others. This is something that we are called to do. And we know that throughout the world, people are crying out for release, for freedom, for what is afflicting them. And we pray for them in Jesus' name. We think of your church in places where it is persecuted. And to be a follower of Jesus Christ can endanger or even cause death. We pray for Christians used to being able to worship together in one place, but denied that freedom because of the coronavirus safety restrictions. Give them, we pray, patience and a strong awareness that they are still united in spirit, if not physically, in times of worship. Give to all church leaders wisdom in decisions about making ways to keep your church active in spite of difficult circumstances. We pray for those who are seeking to find a vaccine that will free the world from this devastating virus. May their labours be successful. We pray for all hospitals and care homes and for all who work in them in their efforts to bring healing and release from suffering of illness. We remember all the people that have gone out of their way to help others and ask your blessing upon them. We pray for all the people who have suffered mentally, emotionally, even financially, as well as physically, as a result of this pandemic. And for those whose lives and livelihoods will be affected for a long time as the long-term effects come into force, may they receive the help they need to rebuild their lives and feel a sense of freedom. Help us to remember that coronavirus is not the only problem in the world. We pray for the people who still in lives live in areas of conflict and in fear for their lives. May people learn to live in peace, harmony and freedom with one another. We pray also for those who are persecuted because of prejudice. May all people come to understand that all lives matter and all are precious in your sight. We pray for all who are grieving the loss of loved ones, especially any known to us. Give them your peace, we pray. And finally, we pause just for a moment to bring before you those we love and ask that they may be freed from anything that threatens to overwhelm them. Loving God, we thank you for the freedom we have to worship you and to bring to you our prayers for the needs of others. For this we do, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you to Vivian and to Alice for what you've brought to our worship today. It's been lovely to connect with you. It's our privilege and joy now to gather around the Lord's table. We can't gather together in the way that we would like to, but we can gather virtually each from our own homes. And so we take whatever we can find, bread, wine, juice, and we remember Jesus. We bring these gifts before God. We also bring our gifts of money. And we thank you uh, for your continued gifts for the life 
and work of the church. We dedicate those to God. Um, if anyone would like to continue to give to the work of the church and um, hasn't been able to, there are links uh, on the website and on the top of the Facebook feed, easy ways of doing that. And also to give to our AV appeal. We're uh, in the process at the moment of de re uh, developing our AV system at the church premises so that we'll be able to live stream from there and have all sorts of um, new equipment which will enhance uh, the way we're able to worship and the way we're able to stream it which is really exciting so we thank god for that and thank you for your gifts and your continued support as we gather around the lord's table now we're going to sing together as your family lord we need to see the words <laughs> Jesus shared his meal, this meal, with all kinds of people, doubters, believers and sceptics, rich and poor, leaders and followers, scholars and fishermen. He calls us all to come and taste and see that the Lord is good, that there is enough for everyone, that there is another way. This is the table where people from all kinds of places and all times meet together. It is Christ who promises to meet us here. This is the table where we can begin a journey, where we can make a turn, where we can be strengthened for the road ahead, where we can experience the freedom that Christ promises us. So come, all of you. Everyone is welcome, wanted and loved. Christ who nourishes us is our peace, Strangers and friends, male and female, old and young. He breaks down barriers to bind us to him and to one another. We are family. So may the peace 
of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. So hear the narrative of the institution of the Lord's Supper as it was recorded by the Apostle Paul. He says, The tradition which I handed on to you came to me from the Lord himself, that on the night of his arrest, the Lord Jesus took bread, and after giving thanks to God, he broke it, and he said, This is my body that's given for you. Do this in memory of me. And in the same way, he took the cup after supper and said, This cup is the new covenant, sealed by my blood. Whenever you drink it, do so in memory of me. For every time you eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. So let us pray. We love your words, Jesus. You speak a balm that soothes our brokenness and you entice us with the winsomeness of grace. We live in a world that strives for many things, power, prestige, position, prowess. We know relationships that hurt and communities that fracture. And you know this too, for you lived alongside us. And into our reality, you spoke beautiful words. You beckon us towards you with arms wide open in welcome, a smile of recognition on your lips. You do not ignore or dismiss all that weighs us down. You know its cost too well. But you accept us as we come with all this baggage and invite us to lay our burden down with you. So help us to do so, trusting that you care and that we might find complete rest. But it is not rest alone you give. So grant us courage to take up the new yoke and the new burden of grace and discipleship, that we might truly follow you, forgiven and grateful. As we break bread and share wine, may these things by the power of your spirit be for us the body and blood of Christ, reminding us of all that he has given, all he has promised, and all he continues to call us to in his name. Amen. Our Lord Jesus took bread and he broke it, saying, This is my body that is given for you. Eat it and remember me. And in the same way, he took the cup, saying, This is my blood poured out for you. Drink it to remember me. We eat, we drink, and we remember.
Loving God, you've been so gracious to us. The gift of Jesus is a gift beyond words. So help us to truly understand the depth of that love, the depth of that grace, and welcome him into our hearts and our lives in every moment. For we pray in his holy name. Amen. Oh man, oh man. Let's go out singing, shall we? By faith we see the hand of God. I've got the other song still going. <laughs>
So God bless you all this week. We're going to share the grace with you and we know that you'll be sharing the grace back to us and to everybody who's sharing this act of worship. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all forevermore. Amen. 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 Um, do join us on Coffee Zoom now if you'd like to. We'd love to chat with you. Um, there's also an opportunity to pray now if you'd like to with my colleague David. Um, and we'll be back with Pause for Prayer on Wednesday. I think that's everything. Yeah. Big, big goodbye. Bye. Oh, sorry. One more thing. One more thing before we stop the feed. Um, a couple of people have been asking about the signs and struggling to remember them week on week. So um, Alice is in the process of recording little reminder videos, which will pop up on the uh, Facebook page and the website so that we can all go back and uh, revise. So we're all going to become experts, hopefully. So thanks to Alice for doing that. OK.